Well, we're continuing our series in Twisted Scripture, and today we're going to look at a couple of lies, a couple of lies that relate to our security in Christ. I mean, last week we were talking about can you fall from grace, can you lose your salvation, and the conclusion was a resounding no way. No way can you lose your salvation. God has secured it. Nothing separates you. Even when we are faithless, He remains faithful. And yet, we still have these, but what about passages? These passages that plague us, that sometimes confuse us and make us wonder, well, what does that mean? I mean, if we're so safe, if we're so secure, then what does that mean? And this is one of those passages where in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, depart from me. And many Christians are asking, is that me? Could that be me? Is God ever going to be sick to death of me? Is He ever going to get tired of me? Am I ever going to sin so much that He's just going to be freaked out and say, you know what, I wash my hands of you, we are done. Well, this morning we're going to see that this too is a lie. And we begin in Matthew chapter 7 with the next suspect, the next passage that is difficult and challenging. Verse 23, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, even on the surface level, there's a few clues here that God is not talking about believers. Have you noticed those clues yet? When you look in this passage, you see the word never. This is not someone who God knew and then got sick of. This is not someone that God had relationship with and then decided to abandon. He says, I never knew you. That means there was no relationship there. And secondly, you'll notice that they're practicing lawlessness. Now that means chaos. That means a life full of nothing but sin total chaos and disorder because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is not in them, not constraining them, not motivating them, not inspiring them. They are literally all over the place in their attitudes and actions, and they are not saved. They don't know God, and God doesn't know them. So, Here's the context of this depart from me passage. And I think that as we look at it together, it's going to open up wide to you. You're going to see it even more clearly that it's not talking about believers. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 15, just a few verses prior, look at, look at the concern that Jesus has. The concern is about false prophets, not believers, but beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And so you've got this image of a wolf, and then they've literally got a sheepskin over them pretending to be something they're not. But they are not sheep. They are not able to hear His voice. He does not know them, and they do not know Him. These are unbelievers. In fact, not only are they unbelievers, but they are pushing people away toward a different message that does not save. They are false prophets. Verse 16, he starts to distinguish true from false, believers from deceivers. Look at this in verse 16. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, are they? Nor figs, are they gathered from thistles? No way. His point is, you're not going to get something good from something bad. And the people he's referencing are bad people. Do you know that it's okay for you to say you're good? I know, I know, we're not supposed to say we're good because only God is good. But wait a minute, if you're born of God, then you're born of good. If you're born again, then you're reborn good. And so when you read this passage, do you see which tree you are. We're about to talk about a good tree and a bad tree. And I think it's pretty important that every good tree in this room recognize that they're good. Here we go. So every good tree bears good fruit, 
But the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Now you say, well, wait a minute, I'm a good tree, but I can sin. So what's going on there? Well, is that really you? I mean, when you sin, I know that we take responsibility for it. I know that it's our job to turn from it. I know that, that we have a, a responsibility to be at peace with all men and to not let sin reign. But what is reigning? When you commit a sin, what is reigning? Well, sin is reigning. You're not reigning. God is not reigning in that moment. Sin is is reigning. You're not reigning. Who you are as a new creation is not reigning. So it's not really coming from your heart, is it? When you've got a new heart, sin can't come from there. When you've got a new spirit, sin can't come from there. We say it all the time. We're letting a parasite reign in that moment. It's something in us that is not us when indwelling sin dominates the moment. And so a good tree cannot really produce bad fruit. We are slaves of righteousness. We're harnessed to righteousness, connected to righteousness, addicted to righteousness. We can't get away from it. Then it goes on. It says, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. What do you call it when a bad tree is producing something that looks good? Well, their righteousness is like filthy rags. They cannot produce Good fruit. So notice who's in focus here. False prophets who look good but aren't good and they can't produce good. That these are the ones who God is going to say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. So how crazy, how ludicrous it is for us to be looking at this passage and then quaking in our boots, fearful of God perhaps ditching us or abandoning us. There's no call for it. Look in verse 19. He says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. So who's the warning about? People that are tossed in a fire. Who's the warning about? People that produce bad fruit. Who's the warning about? It's about the bad tree. Depart from me. I never knew you. He goes on. He says, He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter the kingdom. So then we're scratching our heads going, okay, Jesus, I get it. Maybe I, because I'm a believer, I'm a good tree. I produce good fruit. But now you're saying I got to do the will of your Father. What is that? How do I know when I've done it? I mean, how do I know when I've arrived? We read passages like this, and it's like we're, we're looking in the dark for the answer. And yet here... Here's a brilliant answer. What is the will of my Father? Well, Jesus himself gives it to us in John chapter 6. Look at this. They're they're coming to Jesus and they're asking him specifically the question that we would ask. What is the work of the Father? What is the will of the Father? What is the heart of the Father? What is the agenda of the Father? Give it to me. Shoot me straight here, Jesus. What is it so that I can do it? They say, what shall we do? So that we may work the works of God, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him who He has sent. Now, I'm sure they were expecting Him to pick, oh, at least ten commandments. I'm sure they were expecting Him to pick from the 613 laws in that menu. They were expecting Him to extract the ones that were the most challenging or the ones that were the most glorious the ones that would be the hardest to keep, and then he would put it to them with a big challenge. But you know what they found? They found that, first of all, he's changing their grammar on them. They say, show us the works, and he changes works to work. He changes the plural to a singular, and he's saying, you want the works? Well, let me tell you, the work of the Father is that you believe in the one whom he sent. So, you know, people, uh, well, they argue all the time. They say the whole world's saved. No decision is needed. Oh, if you're saying a decision is needed, then that's a work. You're saying that if we have to choose Christ and receive Christ and open the door to Christ, then that's a work. So you're saying we're saved by a work. Well, okay, I'll agree with you then. But the work of the Father is to believe. 
Do you see what Jesus has done? He's given them a work, but the work is faith. The obedience of faith, Paul calls it. So it's a little trick, isn't it? It's not really human effort, but it's a choice to believe in Jesus. And so there are some who will not do the work of God. I will not open the door. I will not agree with God. I will not put my trust in Christ. I'll sit on my hands and I'll just hedge my bet and hope for the best. And then there are those who turn the doorknob and open the door, the work of faith, the work of believing and receiving. And that's what he is saying is the work of God. And those are the ones who enter the kingdom. But, but there was a group in Matthew 7 who was doing things in the name of Jesus, doing things, all kinds of religious things in the name of Jesus, and yet would not open the door to him. So they were using him. They were using him for for their own personal gain. Who knows what they had on their minds, popularity or money, but they were preaching Christ out of human effort for their own gain. And so he describes them this way. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? Now, if you're thinking along with me, first, you're noticing something that these folks are bragging about, and it's not Jesus. There's something these folks are bragging about, and it's their performance. So, if you're a child of God and you understand the gospel, this is probably the last thing that's going to be on your lips when you hit heaven. Please do not try this at home meaning your new home. Please do not try this at home. Lord, look at all the stuff I did for you. Do not let that be on your lips. Instead, what saves is, Lord, look at all the stuff you did for me. Through the cross and the resurrection, what you gifted me, what you gave me in the gift of righteousness, in the gift of total forgiveness, that is why I get to come home. But these folks, they have the gospel upside down. They have it backwards. They're focused on what they think they've done for God when, in fact, they've never even opened the door to Him. And so you say, well, wait a minute then. I mean, miracles in His name, how were they doing it? Well, first of all, you know what? The enemy, you look at the list of things, and the enemy would love to fabricate a a list of things that distract all kinds of people. Uh, There are many people that use the name of Jesus to perform so-called miracles. My wife, her grandfather, uh, witnessed a rehearsal for this miracle uh, ceremony. Someone had rented a hotel ballroom in the city of Toronto. They were at that time one of the most famous uh, faith healers. They were on television every night. They traveled the world with famous preachers. They were known as one of the elite faith healers. And my wife's grandfather witnessed a rehearsal where this faith healer said, now you in the wheelchair, you're going to come up on the left and you stand here and then I'll pull you out of it. Now you on the right, you come up and you're blind and I'm going to put my hands on you and I'll heal you of blindness. And they rehearsed the whole thing because it was fake. And my wife's grandfather witnessed that rehearsal. He wasn't supposed to be there, but he walked in on it. There are many people doing fake things in the name of Jesus. And as far as exorcisms go, let me tell you, you are hard-pressed to find any verse in the New Testament letters from Peter, Paul, James, or John about Christians casting demons out of other Christians. Not there. So the enemy is happy for us to be distracted as we have a church service where we're casting out and casting out and we'll see you next week to cast more out and then next week to cast even more out so the enemy has us consumed with the enemy instead of preaching the gospel. And so there are many fabrications out there. I'm not saying that God doesn't heal. God heals and He does miracles and He's God and He can do whatever He wants and we submit to it all. But there is fake stuff out there. And so this is why 
Jesus says, I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Not a Christian. So if he's saying, I never knew you, what evidence do we have that he knows us? Well, here's a a brilliant verse. I love this. Paul says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back? This is Galatians 4, and I just want to draw your attention to two things. First, we've come to know God. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Actually, we don't fully know everything about God because He's God and we are not. But He has come to know us. We are known by Him. Every one of His children is known by Him, and we know His voice. And so there's a knowing of us that is true of every believer. That's what Paul is saying. So when Jesus says, I never knew you, he is obviously talking to unbelievers, not Christians. So would true believers be boasting to God about their works? Well, you'd like to think not, right? Unless they're having a moment of insanity. But here Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, he says, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Oh yeah, there's some bragging going on. There's some boasting going on. But it has nothing to do with what we're doing for God. It has everything to do with the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what we'll be bragging on at the gates of heaven. That's what we'll be bragging on for eternity. So these folks in Matthew 7, I mean, they have the whole thing wrong. They have it all upside down. They're into Jesus for selfish gain. They're using his name to abuse and trick other people. They are unbelievers. They are deceivers, not believers. All right, well, now we get to lie number eight. All right, he may never say, depart from me. But what if he blots me out or spits me out? And some of you have a translation that says he's going to spew you out. Now that's just gross. <laughs> so spit or spew or blot. I mean, we got to deal with this stuff because otherwise we're talking about spewing. We're talking out of both sides of our mouths here. Oh yeah, you're secure. Agape love. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Nobody can snatch you out of his hand. Agape, agape, agape. But he is going to vomit if you sin too much and you'll come running out. Gross. And that's what some folks are believing as they engage in this double talk. So first, will he blot you out? Ironically, we're in Revelation, and the passage says the opposite. It says the opposite. It says he'll never blot you out. And then we say, yeah, but might he blot me out? And then he says, I'll never blot you out. And we say, yeah, but might you blot me out? And does not compute total security. Not computing. I mean, we have got to see how straightforward this thing is. Here it is in verse 5 of Revelation 3. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And somehow, I kid you not, one of those popular questions that I get on the radio broadcast is... Revelation says he will blot us out. And then all I say is, no, it doesn't. And then I take the next call. (laughs) But seriously, that's how straightforward this is. It's crazy that the enemy can twist the scriptures in people's minds. It says, I will not erase his name. And then the next thing we do in our fear grid in our trembling, and our worrying, and our neurotic twisting of the Scriptures, we say, but wait a minute, that is only he who overcomes. So how do I know if I'm an overcomer? I mean, maybe I'm one of the weak Christians. Maybe I'm one of the Christians that he doesn't carry on to completion. Maybe somehow uh, somebody does snatch me out of his hand. Maybe when I'm faithless, he doesn't remain faithful to me, but just the other Christians. Maybe I individually am not an overcomer. So is it about your strength? Is it about your ability to overcome? Is that what... This writer is saying, well, we look 
in the same book of the Bible at how we overcome Revelation chapter 12, it says, And they overcame him, talking about the enemy, the accuser. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. Their testimony about whom? Their testimony about all the great stuff they did? No, their testimony about Jesus. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. What does that mean? Well, they got a new life. They got a new life in Jesus, just like you and I. We may never be faced with some sort of torture. I mean, the early church, they were dragged from their homes. And they were burned and stoned to death and faced all kinds of persecution. But they had exchanged an old life for a new life. They overcame because of the blood of the Lamb, not their human effort. They overcame because of the word of their testimony about Jesus. Their testimony was the opposite of what we see in Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, those folks, their testimony was, Look what we have done for you. Now, the other testimony that John writes about here is, Look at the Lamb of God whose blood has taken away my sins forever. I overcome because of the blood of the Lamb and because I have an innate heartfelt testimony in my heart about what he has done to me and for me. Okay, but will he spit you out? And now we get to the final part of our message this morning. He won't blot you out. He won't say, depart from me, but might he spew you out, spit you out, go, that is gross. I'm so sick of that Christian. And then spit you out. Well, here's the passage where it comes from, Revelation chapter 3. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. That's interesting. Some of us are afraid of being too cold. We've got to stay hot, hot for the Lord, right? Stay on fire. <laughs> Say that with me, on fire. Yeah, you could be a televangelist. I wish that you were cold or hot. Apparently cold is okay too. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So what's going on here? Is this loss of salvation? Well, first, let me say this. Never once are we told that salvation is like being in the mouth of God. I mean, that would be an unusual expression. We are not in the mouth of God, and then suddenly, suddenly he's sick of us, and we're out of the mouth of God. So in and out of the mouth of God is never an expression in the New Testament to talk about salvation. So then you say there must be a more intelligent meaning behind this passage. And some great news there is. There's a very straightforward meaning of this passage. Now, the secret to understanding this has to do with, with realizing it's okay to be cold. It's okay to be hot. Just don't, don't be lukewarm because lukewarm water, well, I mean, it, it has practically no purpose. So what's going on here? Well, God is talking to a church, a group of people in Laodicea. Now, what's curious about Laodicea is that they happen to have no water supply of their own. Now, that's interesting. Why would God use this analogy for Laodicea? Well, there's your reason. They had no water supply of their own. And so, interestingly, there was a city called Heropolis nearby, and Heropolis had hot springs. And so Laodicea would have their water piped in from Heropolis. Now you would think that that water would show up just hot and useful for a cup of hot tea or a cup of coffee or sitting in the hot tub. But here's what happens is when that water finally arrives from Heropolis, it is lukewarm in the city of Laodicea. Bummer. Now, there's another city near Laodicea, and it's known as Colossae. That's where we see the letter of the Colossians written to. So Colossae has cold springs. Now, that water, too, could be piped in from Colossae to Laodicea. And you would think that that would be ice-cold water by the time it reached Laodicea. So refreshing 
on a hot summer day. But no, once again, that water also would end up lukewarm once it reached Laodicea. Now, do you see how clever God is in this, in this uh, exhortation to the people of Laodicea? He's saying, look how useful the water in Heropolis is. It is hot. Look how useful the water in Colossae is. It is ice cold. But here you are smack dab in the middle with water that serves no purpose. You've got the water, but it's lukewarm. It serves no purpose. Now, I love hot water when I'm snowboarding in New Mexico, the mountains of New Mexico with Tyson. We will go and we will snowboard together. And if we can find a hot tub or some hot springs or whatever that night to soak our muscles in, man, that is some good relief because hot water serves a purpose. Now, when it's 108 in Lubbock, Texas, and I've been outside, let's say, on the golf course for five hours, I come in from that on a Saturday, and I am sweating, ready for a cold drink. I love lemonade, but it better have ice in it, because ice cold water or lemonade serves a purpose. It's refreshing, but never once in either of those cases am I craving lukewarm water. And so God is not saying that they've lost their salvation. He's saying they've lost their purpose. They've lost their focus. They're not focused. They have lost sight of their first love. They're not depending on Christ. They have forgotten what it means to be saved. They have forgotten their purpose and their focus. It is about loss of purpose, not loss of salvation. And how do we know that? Well, as we finish out this passage, I just want you to look for these key words. I've highlighted them in yellow. By the way, before we get there, I will say that this is the passage that contains that salvation appeal. I stand at the door and knock. Open the door and I'll come in. Isn't it interesting that we're so worried that all these people are saved and all of them are losing their salvation or something. And right there in the middle is an evangelistic appeal to these people. Now that ought to tell you something, that it's a mixed bag, that this group doesn't all get it. Now look at this in verse 17. You say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So the believers have lost their focus. And apparently there's a bunch of people in Laodicea that are still spiritually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Not believers. You're not naked. You're clothed with the righteousness of God. You're not wretched and miserable and poor. You have the riches that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 18 So what is God's advice? Well, you need me. (laughs) That's what he's saying. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. That's the spiritual riches in Christ. White garments so that you may clothe yourselves. Not literal garments, but the spiritual garment of being clothed with Christ. And that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Believers are not spiritually naked. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. In other words, you need to be able to see spiritual truth. And a natural man cannot discern the things of the Lord. Only a spiritual man can because he's given the Spirit of God. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. 90 sometimes in the 90% plus in the New Testament, repent is used for the salvation experience. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Sound familiar? Evangelism. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. So we've got a situation here and it's messy. Let's not deny that it's messy. In the city of Laodicea, there are some believers. And and these believers, many of them, have lost focus and they have forgotten their purpose. And then in the midst of that group, there are also people who think they're okay, but they have not yet believed. They have not yet received. They have not yet opened the door of their lives to Christ. And so it's a mixed bag. It's known as humanity. 
I mean, if Paul were to write the church at Lubbock today, the church in West Texas today, and all the Christians or even those who think they're Christians were to gather and hear this letter, and we could somehow see people's hearts, there would be many, many, many believers, and then there would be some who are just confused. Well, I'm living a good life. Well, I grew up in a church. I grew up in a Christian home. I've always done pretty good things. I do more good than bad. I've been baptized. I mean, that's the way it would be today. That's the way it was back then. But nowhere in any of these passages today have we seen someone who has eternal life that, uh, actually that was temporary life. Someone who has total forgiveness. Uh, no, actually that was partial forgiveness because you did one more. Nowhere in any of these passages do we see anything remotely like loss of salvation. So conclusion, what did we see today? The lie that God will tell some believers, depart from me. No, that was people he never knew, unbelievers. And then the lie that God may blot you out. Revelation actually says the opposite. I'll never blot you out or spit you out. No, that was a warning about remembering your purpose. And so we see the conclusion then. Paul puts it best perhaps in Romans chapter 8. I am convinced. And I guess the question is, are you convinced? I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Are you a created thing? I'm a created thing. No created thing, including you, can mess this up. No created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the security that Jesus Christ bought us. We put our confidence in that. We say with the Apostle Paul, I am convinced. Father, this morning, we are convinced that the work of Jesus Christ was good enough, that it was perfect, that it is finished, and that we are forever secured in you and no one can snatch us away. Father, we are convinced that nothing separates us We are convinced that even when we blow it, when we doubt, when we mess up, when we're all over the place, when we are faithless, you remain faithful. We put our confidence in you. And Father, we are convinced. In Jesus' name, amen.